Welcome to Bodcast, the Business of Dentistry podcast, brought to you by Practice Plan. Bodcast delivers the best business advice, real life stories, and practical hints and tips to make your practice a more profitable and sustainable business. And now, here's your host. This time out, Monica McColt is talking to Rebecca Johnson, a specialist financial planner at Wesleyan Financial Services. A pair of them will be discussing the importance of business agreements for dentists and how they improve business continuity, resolve disputes, and help overall planning for the future. They'll also touch upon legacy planning and how it impacts on the individuals personally. As always, this podcast is for information only and doesn't provide either financial or business planning advice. But if you do feel like you need advice, stay tuned until the end where I'll let you know how to get in touch with us. And with that, I'll hand you over to Rebecca and first up, Monica. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much for joining us today to share your insights as a specialist financial planner. And I was wondering if you could share with us why it's so important for dentists to have business agreements in place. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, of course. That's a great question, actually. Business agreements are actually the heart and soul of most companies and organisations. They help ease business operations and processes without friction in between involved parties. Um, And when executed correctly, they can help to manage business expectations and avoid liability. Mm. Without the right agreements in place, business continuity, business succession, tax allowances and business reliefs are all impacted. And no business should operate without a written agreement in place, really, not least one in the dental industry. Um, Businesses of any kind can be subject to disputes at any time and difficulties can arise unless strict agreements are there setting out how the business should operate. Agreements provide written guidelines as to how any conflict will be dealt with, allowing issues to be settled quickly and easily. And they also bring clarity to all parties involved in the practice. It's important to realise that even if there's no formal legal structure in place around any business, if two or more individuals conduct business together Mm. uh, with a view to making a profit, then a partnership will exist in law. Um, And this means that the liabilities and duties of the partner will be governed by the Partnership Act 1890, which is obviously not likely to be particularly suitable for today's business environment. No, that sounds really, really quite dated. (laughs) Yeah, very dated. Um, No, you know, chance that this is going to be updated anytime soon. Um, So that's always going to be the case unless there's a formal agreement in place to supersede it. The consequence of, you know, that act is that the partnership will automatically dissolve if one partner resigns, retires or dies. Um, And in in addition, all partners must share equally in the profits of the business, regardless of the amount of kind of investment in time and capital that they contribute, Um, which, you know, could obviously be a bone of contention at any point during the lifetime of that business, I guess. I don't know if you've had any clients where a lack of formal agreements have caused business relationships to break down. And do you think this has a knock on effect on personal financial planning as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's a couple of examples that spring to mind. Um, So there's currently um, an example where there's a partnership operating at the moment with no agreements in place where one of the partners has been ill. um, And so working only a couple of days a month. This is obviously difficult for the healthy partner um, who's working full time and generating most of the profit for the business. So the poorly partner's health is such that there's no likely change to their working pattern in the future. Um, And the healthy partner doesn't have the funds to buy the other partner out of the business. So this is obviously affecting how the how profitable the business is, the value of the business and the operation as a whole. But also from the healthy partner's perspective, this is affecting his personal finances, which are completely limited by the situation. He feels out of control and sadly there's no end in sight, unfortunately. But if they'd had the right agreements and financial plans in place prior to the partner suffering ill health, it would have avoided the situation entirely. So quite quite a tricky one there unfortunately Um, and the second example is a little more complex and a longer running situation 
So it started with a very successful limited company owned by three brothers. Sadly, one died from cancer aged just 45 and left behind a wife and two young children. There were no formal agreements in place because it was a family business and they'd not felt it was necessary. So following the brother's death, the family collapsed basically into dysfunctional squabbling and the oh, deceased. That's terrible. It's awful, isn't it? The deceased mm. widow and two young children were not paid their fair share. And the widow took the case to the High Court, where the court found in her favour. Um, mm. And they actually found that after the brother had died, the remaining brothers used the company basically as their own personal piggy bank. And while the financial rights of the widow and her children were completely ignored, over the course of 10 years, the widow was excluded from important company meetings um, and the two remaining brothers took out over £1 million in informal director's loans, creating a huge risk for the company. Um, and over the same period, the judge also found that on top of the loan account, the brothers had paid themselves salaries and bonuses that were far too high, in most cases excessive. Um, but at the same time, no payments of salary or benefits, which the deceased brother would have earned, were paid to the widow and her children. So it left them completely without income. That case rumbled on um, in the courts for years and years. And after a high court battle, the brothers were eventually ordered to personally buy the widow and the children out of the company. Um, on paper, this would have completely rectified the widow's financial circumstance and allowed her to support her children. But unfortunately, mm. by this point, the brothers, despite significant efforts to comply with the order, they were unable to make the payments to the widow. The business ended and the widow eventually filed for bankruptcy. And it's such a sad story because, you know, had they taken the time at any point prior to that brother passing away to put some business agreements in place to back that up with the financial plans needed then it would have resulted in allowing the business to continue the widow and her children to maintain their lifestyle and avoid the emotional trauma of the situation for everyone basically yeah it sounds as though it's had massive implications on on everyone's lives in that that situation and if they'd just got that into place as you'd said it could have been avoided. Absolutely. It could have been so easily avoided, unfortunately. But, you know, I mean, I guess for anyone else, it's a stark warning of what could be the case, even in a very close knit, what was originally a very close knit family. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with that example, you've really answered the, um, the next question I was going to ask you, which is if you could explain how business agreements relate to legacy planning, because it really does have a direct impact or can yeah. have a direct impact it does it does I mean there is more to it than that I guess it's a great example of you know how the widow would have received you know uh, the funds in order to maintain her and her children's lifestyle but but there is more to it than that I guess because the presence of the business agreement not only kind of allows you to um, dictate what will happen on your death and ensure that legacy and I'm sure that the deceased brother imagined that if he had died his wife would have been handsomely provided for which she wasn't unfortunately but there's also valuable business property reliefs um, and inheritance tax reliefs that can be um, facilitated through the right agreement so that can save kind of 40 percent of the value of the business that could be due in tax potentially um, it can also preserve nil rate bans for inheritance tax purposes saving thousands and thousands of pounds but having the wrong agreement in place mm can mean the opposite as well. So it's not just having an agreement in place, it's having the right agreement in place. to, And then, as I say, backing that up with the financial provision to make sure that's the reality. And that feeds directly into personal financial circumstances, really, mm -hmm. because, you know, businesses are one thing, but the, at the end of a business is families who are relying on that income who don't know what's going to happen in future. No one knows what's going to happen in future. Everyone goes into a business with the mindset that nothing will change, everything mm. will stay the same. And, and we know that that actually doesn't happen in anyone's case, really. Um, so when it comes to legacy planning, 
having the right agreement in place can really be the starting point for helping to ensure that that legacy is going to the right place, that all of the tax allowances are um, taken advantage of. So as much of a legacy is received, received as possible it can also provide funding to ensure that that becomes a reality. So that's where the business agreement has to go hand in hand with good financial planning. And, you know, at the very end of things, it can ensure that, as I say, that legacy is protected away from things like creditors, bankruptcy, doesn't, you know, change the right to means tested benefits if that's a factor in the financial circumstance of, of the individual keeps funds within a family so there's so much to it and what's the best way do you think for a dentist to to go about it i mean if they've already got business agreements in place how often would you recommend reviewing the agreements to make sure that it's the most appropriate and suitable agreement for the current setup because things change don't they over time yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd say that absolutely you have to review them on a regular basis and it, it's reasonably individual. But to check in on your business agreements as part of your annual financial review is always good. Mm. You know, to take that small amount of time on something that will have a huge financial impact at some point in the future uh, is very worthwhile and it doesn't take very long to do, especially if you're doing that on a regular basis. It's just a check in uh, with your financial professional to look and see what's there. Make sure you've got the right financial planning in place to make sure that, you know, nothing's changed and it, it's still the right thing. And then, you know, on a regular basis, that's going to mean that you're completely safe. You've locked in your financial circumstance. Your business is, is set up correctly. Yeah, then you've got the reassurance that you're covered, I guess, and then yeah. review it the following year. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time for today. But Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on and for okay. sharing your insights. It's been really, really helpful. And okay. hopefully we'll have you again soon. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me. And that's our show for this week. Thank you to Monica and Rebecca. If you are looking for expert financial advice for you or your practice, go to wesleyan.co.uk where you can book a no obligation appointment with one of our specialist financial advisors. To learn more about Wesleyan more generally, you can find us on Twitter, Stroke X, and Facebook, Instagram, and of course, LinkedIn. And if you found the podcast useful, you can like and subscribe to us on all the usual podcast platforms, as well as on YouTube. And there's a whole library of videos covering a wide range of financial planning topics. <laughs>